right, so let me ask you a question. How many of you have ever been to war? Yeah! Woo! Fun fact, I asked Michelle to be my girlfriend in war. Real story, true story, no cap. No cap. All right, so what is, let me just say this, appropriately, what is Walmart known for? So that I could gain Christ. 
<laughs> so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through the obeying of the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with him himself depends on faith. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another, I will experience the resurrection from the dead. All right, let's pray. Jesus, I thank you so much for your love. I thank you for the infinite value of what it is to know our God, our King, the creator of the universe, Jesus. And so we pray tonight, God, that we would see that you're worth it. Jesus, you are worth it. Whatever it costs us, whatever challenges we may face, you're worth it. Lord, I pray that you would just speak through me, open our ears, our hearts to hear, to receive and be transformed. In the name of Jesus, amen. 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 So what is Jesus worth? What is he worth sacrificing for? What is he losing for? Again, verses 7 and 8 is kind of the primary chunk for this part of the message. I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I've discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage, so that I can gain Christ. So when you think about your relationship with Jesus, what price have you had to pay for him? What have you sacrificed so that you can have a real relationship with Jesus? There are three things tonight that I want to kind of highlight to you guys as, as kind of I know there are a lot of very specific things that we could point to, but I want to give you three major areas and kind of break into them. And so the first thing that we lose or we give up in our pursuit of Christ is our sin, our selfishness, our past life. 1 Peter 4, 3-5 says this, You have had enough in the past of the evil things that godless people enjoy. Their immorality and lust, their feasting and drunkenness and wild parties, and their terrible worship of idols. Of course, your former friends are surprised when you no longer plunge into the flood of wild and destructive things they do. So they slander you. But remember that they will have to face God, who stands ready to judge everyone, both the living and the dead. You see, when you and I give our lives to Christ, we say goodbye to the old us. We leave behind our sin, our selfishness, those things that we know are contrary to the character and nature of God. The things that honestly put Jesus on the cross. Right? How can we continue to live in the things that put Jesus on the cross and call ourselves Christians? Right? Acts 2, 37 and 38 says this. Um, this is, these verses are speaking to the day of Pentecost and Peter gets up and he preaches and we know that 3,000 people get saved. But at the very end of his sermon, this is kind of what happens. Verse 37 of chapter 2, it says, Peter's word pierced their heart and convicted them. And they said to him and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, Each of you must repent of your sins, meaning turn away from them, abandon your whole life. The actual Greek word for repent is metanoia, which a lot of times makes me think about the word metamorphosis. So when we repent of our sins, we are actually transformed away from what we used to be. And then we turn to God and be baptized or immersed into the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit who empowers us to live free of that past life. Um, for those of you here a couple weeks ago with baptisms, what was the first question that we asked before we baptized you? Say it loud and proud. Do you renounce your old life? Do you renounce or reject your old life of sin and selfishness? 
meaning are you willing to count that law as laws all of your past life that is in rebellion to God and that is committed to selfish pursuits? Are you willing to abandon that in order to come to Jesus? Because truthfully, you cannot follow Jesus and follow our own selfish, sinful desires. You can't. They're going two opposite directions. Okay? Romans 6, 1 through 4 echoes this thought. Well then, should we continue on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. Uh, I remember at Come Together years ago, uh, Pierce, he's the director at Arkansas Technical University with Chi Alpha, and he translated, he kind of put it in every day where instead of, of course not, he said, heck no, bro. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it any longer? Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ in baptism, we joined him in his death? For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism, and just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may, be, may live new lives. Again, the old, I, I love this because when we did baptisms, Amanda, I, I love in, in when she was sharing testimony at the end of service, she said, the old Amanda is dead. And in order to come to Jesus, the old you has to die. Not, not like be put in the closet or, you know, you just stay there and be quiet. They have to die. And so the question is, have you killed the old you that is trying to keep you from Jesus? And until you do that, he, will, he or she will always fight you and keep you from being close to God as he wants you to be. And so we have to be willing to lose the old me, the old life of sin and selfishness in order to gain Christ. The second thing that Jesus is worth is our clout or our status. <laughs> Our selfish ambition. I mean, we all have things that we want to do and want to achieve. We all want to be recognized. We all want to be seen. We all want to be noticed, right? It's interesting, even, even Paul here in his writing talks about his status, his clock. He says, circumcised on eighth day, which is a direct obedience to Le Leviticus 12, pure-blooded citizen of Israel, meaning his parents, their parents, their parents are all Hebrew, of Israel, pure blood descent. The tribe of Benjamin, which was one of the 12 tribes of Israel, a member of the Pharisees, basically, okay, so for Israel, a lot of times we think about the Pharisees as like the super religious elite, right? But the Pharisees literally had to memorize the entire Old Testament. The entire Old Testament. Testament to be a Pharisee. It's crazy. Zealously or passionately persecuted the church. <laughs> That's not my computer. It's yours. It's okay. Zealously persecuted the church. And we, we see that. You know, when Stephen was martyred at the very beginning of Acts chapter 8. Who was standing there? Paul. A.K.A. Well, he was Saul at that point. But he stood there as Stephen was killed. And then lastly, he said, obey the law without fault. What a statement. It's so interesting too, verse 5 really sums it up. A real Hebrew if there ever was one. So Paul is like, look, these are my credentials. This is my status in obedience to the law of God. Now, when you, when you think about yours, you know, when I was processing this and thinking of like, okay, what are, what are we pursuing as far as status or recognition? Um, a lot of times, I think nowadays, a lot of that is connected to social media. You know, how many followers do we have? How many likes do we have on our posts? How many people viewed our story? All of these different things. And even like going through all the comments and like just finding our affirmation and our value and what people comment on our, you know, Instagram or on our TikTok or whatever. We're, we're, 
It just, we feed off of that stuff. A new study done by the National Institute of Health in June of 2020 found that individuals who are involved in social media, gaming, texting, mobile phones, etc., are more likely to experience depression. Depression. The previous study found a 70% increase, 70% increase in self-reported depressive symptoms among the group using social media. The clout you are pursuing on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok, YouTube, is literally killing you. It's the, the thing that you're craving the most in recognition on your social media is literally killing you. And so is it really worth what you want? Now, obviously, we're not just talking about social media as far as selfish ambition things that we go after. I mean, life itself. I mean, how many times have you made a decision to do something dumb or destructive or even sinful for the recognition of others? If your friends are pushing you into sin and away from God, then they are not the friends that God wants for you. Paul even says... Bad company corrupts good character. And so if you want to be healthier physically, emotionally, and spiritually, you have to be with, willing to let go of your clout or your status, especially to let your social media take it out. We have to let it go. We cannot find our identity in our social media or even in the recognition of others. And then thirdly, our dreams, or our plans for our life, right? My plans for my life. You know, it's really easy for us to look at the moment that we gave our life to Jesus and just focus on, well, Jesus, I've made all these mistakes, and I need you to fix all these mistakes. I've done all these sins, and I need you to forgive me of these sins because I really don't want to go to hell. And so can you just forgive me? Cleanse me, you know, take care of this, Jesus. Take, take all these bad things that I've done. But when we come to Christ, Jesus doesn't just get our garbage. He gets our dreams, our plans, our future as well. He gets all of it. You can't give Jesus some of it and call him your king. For your Lord. He either gets all of it or he gets none of it. Um, I think about this in my life of am I willing to give up my plans for God's plan? Uh, so I, I've, I mentioned this in the past, but uh, Chi Alpha does what's called a CMIT, a campus ministry and training, and basically the Chi Alpha internship as we call it. I, I remember Michelle and I when we first got married. Uh, we got married in November of 2012. And in January, after that, I started feeling like the Lord was drawing my heart to do the Kyle Fan internship. And I just, I knew it was the Lord. I knew this was his plan. But I remember specifically in prayer one day telling God, look, Lord, if this is what you want, you're going to have to tell her about it. Um, and so in that, like, y'all know Michelle as someone who loves Kai Alpha loves serving but honestly we were in a place or she was in a place more in that moment where she was like i'm ready to be done with this because we didn't grow up in a kyofa like this like we had kyofa but you have something beautiful and wonderful and missional discipleship that's life-changing we we had some of that but like not like this and so i was like lord if, if you want me to do this full time and do this internship you're gonna have to tell michelle and so God did, and Michelle was fully supportive of that. We moved to Fayetteville, and it was life-changing. But I remember, uh, so those of you don't know, I graduated from Henderson in 2012. Michelle graduated in 2013. And so during that year, 
I worked at the Sears here in Arkadelphia. I sold appliances and, and you know, make good enough money for us. A newly married couple living in Arkadelphia, Arkansas, in a little two bedroom, one bath house. It was plenty, it was good. But I remember when I said yes to God's plan for my life, I had to tell my boss, I had to tell him that I was leaving. And I remember him getting upset not necessarily at me, but just like, man, I got your trade up so good and you're doing so good. And say, like, he was genuinely frustrated because the Lord was blessing me in his business. But I remember the last day that I walked out, uh, my final day at work, I locked up the store, was walking around the building to, to my truck. And my heart, guys, was just in turmoil. I literally was like, what am I doing? Why am I leaving this, the security of this job to go do this internship and try and raise support and then trust people to give every month so that we can have a, a living? What am I doing? And that next morning, again, we were, we were early on in the process of We really just started maybe a month or two into it. Maybe probably even a, a month into it. And so there was some who had already started giving. And so we got our first missionary paycheck the next day. I had no awareness that that was going to happen. But in that, I heard the voice of the Holy Spirit just speak and just say, like, if you will trust me, I will take care of you. And so in that, I realized I gave up my plan for God's plan. And God was going to take care of me in that plan. But then we, we moved to Fayetteville in July 2013. Um, there's a little bit of excitement, a little bit of nervousness. So we get moved into the Applebee Apartments on Greg Avenue there in Fayetteville. And our apartment is basically right in front of the, the kind of office, the Applebee offices. And so on the bottom floor to the right, when we go up and I open the door, and I get absolutely punched in the face by cigarette smoke. I look and I see the smoke detector laying on the counter. And our apartment is absolutely soaked in cigarette smoke. I mean, unbearable cigarette smoke. Like literally within the hour, Michelle and I have headaches and we have to leave because it is absolutely Unbearable, And I'm like, Lord, I said yes to your plan. I, I'm, I'm here to do your work on campus. Why am I facing this? I said yes to his plan. I faced hardship. We even faced breast cancer while we were there as well. But you know what? That year altered the course of my future. And I'm so grateful for that year in Fayetteville, Arkansas serving with the University of Arkansas High Alpha Ministry. I wouldn't change a thing, except maybe to be a little more obedient to what God was asking me. And so my question to you is, are you willing to give up your dreams, your plans, for your life to gain Jesus? If Jesus asked you to change your major, would you do it? If Jesus asked you to give up the career you've been wanting since you were five years old, would you do it? If Jesus asked you to move to another country to reach those who've never heard the good news of Jesus, would you do it? Is Jesus worth the cost of your dreams and plans? Some of you are so scared to ask Jesus his plans for your life because you feel like he's going to screw up everything that you have planned. And that just shows that you really don't trust him. That you don't believe he's a good father who has your best at heart. So, are you willing to accept the loss of your plans and dreams to gain Christ and his plans for your life? Lane, if you'll come play on the piano. Just, just some background. All right, so final thoughts. Let me kind of bring this in. 
So going back to our main text, uh, starting in verse 8, Philippians 3, 8, it says, Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage, so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness, though obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. Here we go. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, share in his death, so that one way or another, I will experience the resurrection from the dead. Christ is worth the suffering. I want you to think about the most painful moment of your entire life. Was Jesus worth that suffering? Was Jesus worth going through that? You know, I think about, I already mentioned, like going through breast cancer with Michelle while we were doing an internship. Jesus was worth going through that. I think about family members that we've lost. Jesus is worth that suffering. Maybe you think about family that you've lost. Maybe battles that you faced. Maybe you think about the friends that you've lost because you said yes to Jesus and pushed away from an old life of sin and selfishness. Maybe you think about the conflict that you've gone through with family because you've said yes to Jesus. Is Jesus worth that suffering? Is Jesus worth the suffering of the thousands upon thousands who die each year for being Christian. Why in the world would someone suffer for Jesus? Why would they do that? 1 John 3.16 says this, We know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. Why do we suffer for Jesus? Why would we want to suffer for Jesus? Because Jesus suffered for us. He gave it all for us. But also when we willingly suffer for Jesus, when we sacrificially give ourselves for Jesus, people are changed. Things happen. I want to end tonight by telling you about First of all, a man by the name of J.W. Tucker. J.W. Tucker and his family served as AG Assemblies of God missionaries to the Congo. On November 24, 1964, at the hands of Congolese rebels, with his hands tied behind his back, J.W. Tucker was brutally beaten with broken bottles. After being tortured along with 60 of his other Christian compatriots, their captors threw them into the river to be eaten alive by crocodiles. That man right there gave his life in, in the Congo for Jesus. But as a result of J.W. Tucker's martyrdom, a great revival swept through the region. Thousands decided to follow Jesus, and hundreds experienced divine healing. And it was even reported that some were even raised from the dead. J.W. Tucker is quoted with this before he left for the Congo. God didn't call me to come back. He called me to go. The second missionary I want to tell you about is Jamelia. He's a little more well-known. Jamelia and his family, along with other missionaries, went to the country of Ecuador. And there, he was killed. This is the story of the day that he gave his life. The missionaries were flown 
in one by one and dropped off on the Achaia beach. Nate Saint, another one of the guys that was on the team, flew over the Akuya village and called for the Akuyas to come to the beach. After four days, four days, an Akuya man and two women appeared. It was not easy for them to understand each other since the missionaries only knew a few Akuya phrases. They shared a meal with them and Nate even took them took the man for a flight in the plane. The missionaries tried to show sincere friendship and asked them to bring others next time. For the next two days, the missionaries waited for the Akuyas to return. Finally, on day six, two Akuya women walked out of the jungle. Jim Elliott and Pete, another one of the missionaries, excitedly jumped up in the river and waded over to them. As they got closer, these women did not appear friendly. Jim and Pete almost immediately heard a terrifying cry behind them. As they turned, they saw a group of Akuya warriors with their spears raised, ready to throw. Jim Elliott reached for the gun in his pocket. He had decided he had to decide instantly if he should use it, but he knew he couldn't. Each of the missionaries had promised that they would not kill an Akuya who did not know Jesus to save himself from being killed. Within seconds, the Akuya warriors threw their spears, killing all the male missionaries there. Ed McCulley, Roger Yadari, Nate Said Saint, Pete Fleming, and Jim Elliott. What's crazy is that each of these men, these missionaries, their wives moved in and lived among this tribe that killed their husband and reached them for Jesus. Could you imagine sharing the good news of Jesus with someone who murdered your spouse? Jim Milley is accredited with this quote. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. I think he knows what that means. Jesus said this in John 12, 24 through 25. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone. But its death will produce many new kernels, a beautiful harvest of new lives. Those who love their life in this world will lose it, but those who care nothing for their life in this world will keep it for eternity. And so my final question to you 